Hello everybody, this is Kevin Jones with the Museum at the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising, welcoming you to another edition of Collection Conversations. Um, I am um, coming to you from Los Angeles, California, so everybody on the West Coast, good morning. Everybody on the East Coast, good afternoon. And everybody across the seas, I hope you're having a great evening. I am really looking forward to today's conversation. Um, talking about an incredible athlete whom I hope that you have heard of before. Uh, her name is Althea Gibson, and she is very close to um, all of us at the FIDA Museum because of the project that we have been working on lately, uh, which some of you may have heard about over and over and over, we hope so, uh, which is called Sporting Fashion. And uh, I just happen to have the catalog uh, with me right now. We're very happy that today, uh, or excuse me, this week, um, the catalog was actually released to the public and you can now purchase the catalog. Um, it's online through Amazon right now, but we are going to have it available through the Fit and Museum website. Um, we're, we're a little behind the curve of getting this up because we revamped our entire website. We're very proud. Um, and uh, it will be available. So you could purchase it straight through the FIDA Museum. Um, and the, the person that we're gonna be talking about today, so here's the cover, um, and uh, this is our 1930s uh, motorcycling ensemble, which was actually based on um, an ensemble from a photo I saw of the motorcycle rider, Bessie Stringfield, and she would be another incredible person to talk to today. But the actual lady we're gonna talk about is on the back cover. Um, for those of you, you need to flip your books over who, who already have them, uh, and you can see that this is the amazing Althea Gibson. And today I am going to be speaking with Shelby Ivy Christie, um, who is an authority on um, Althea Gibson, and I'm just waiting for her to log in. I'm just going to check to see if I missed her streaming coming in so I can invite her to join us. Hold on one second. I don't want to miss her feed. I've been very much looking forward to being able to talk with her. Uh, we have not met in person. Uh, but she has a lot of experience um, as a researcher, and she herself is a costume historian. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of background first um, about Althea Gibson, and I have lots of uh, photos today to show you, because she was an extraordinarily accomplished individual. Um, she was born in uh, South Carolina in 1927 and um, just had a great interest uh, in, in all, really all things sport. Um, she accomplished a lot in her lifetime. Had she probably lived today, there would have been a lot more for her to accomplish and, and to have recognition. One of the, um, the main aspects of her life was tennis. She really devoted her life to tennis. However, she did get into other sporting activities later in her life, um, really as a means of making ends meet. Because at the time that she lived, there were not the types of prize monies available to um, athletes like there are today. If you win the Super Bowl, you know, you get millions of dollars as an athlete. Or if you win a, a PGA tournament, you get you know, millions of dollars. If you, if you win Wimbledon, you know, there, there are, there's prize money involved. There's, you know, lots of sponsorships, ticket sales, merchandise um, sales which, you know, generates so much funds that um, the, the, happily the athletes get to benefit by this as well. And that did, was not the case in Althea's time period. I Shelby, Shelby is waiting to, to join us. So there's not a, there was not a lot of, of ability to monetize one's um, um, life. Uh, hi, Shelby, how are you? Good, how are you? Let me get settled. 
Hi. I'm very well, thank you. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I have so been looking forward to meeting you and to talk about somebody that both of us are very fascinated with. Yes, um, Althea Gibson is someone who interests me. I first got interested in her from a style perspective um, and that's what kind of led me down the whole wormhole of learning more about who she was and how legendary her work was and kind of how she broke barriers for black women, not only in tennis, but also in golf. So yeah, right. I'm just really looking forward to chopping it up with you and uh, learning more about, you know, kind of your interests in Althea and kind of what drove you to kind of learn more about her. Great. Well, before we get started, I need to introduce you, and I have a really fabulous bio that I want to read because you are also quite an accomplished woman. And um, I, it, for those who don't know you, and, they, and I'm sure everybody does, I just want to give a quick <laughs> no, background. No. <laughs> Shelby Ivy Christie is a costume historian changing the world of fashion. She combines nearly 10 years of professional experience, having worked at legacy publications like Vogue, InStyle, W Magazine, with her background in history to examine fashion and dress through the lenses of race, class, and culture. Yeah. Christie is passionate about black history and how fashion topics like economics, culture, society, intersect with fashion. She uses her research skills to unearth untold black fashion stories and narratives in her social media platforms. Christy marries um, uh, in-depth research, primary sources and historical text, which I love to do too, with what I think is so innovative, um, internet contents like memes and trending topics to transform academic subjects into more accessible, and exciting themes that have attracted large followings and press attention, including commentary on Netflix, NBC, and CBS networks. As a Southerner, hailing from North Carolina, you're bound to find her signature y'alls um, in her fashion Twitter threads. Christy was recently honored, and this is amazing, with <laughs> placement in Forbes 30 Under 30 Art and Style Class of 2021. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for introducing me. I mean, that's a wonderful bio. Shout out to my PR, Jalen. Um, but thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yeah, you know, I, my, my love and passion for history has always kind of stemmed from my parallel passion for Blackness and African-American history and just history of Black, you know, contributions throughout the diaspora. So, of course, I gravitate, gravitated towards Althea and jumped at the opportunity to kind of talk to you about her contribution. So I'm excited to be talking with you. Thank you. And, you know, we um, in the office came up with some questions on our own, but we also, as um, our viewers know, we always put out a call for questions um, the, the, the week of our collection conversation. So um, that, you know, anything that we didn't think of uh, and that targeted uh, thought process uh, could come from our viewers as well. Plus we have our, our, our feed here, uh, and if anybody has any questions as we're going along, um, I'll try to, to squeeze in some if we can. But I mean, honestly, it, it really, it starts, it, it starts all the way with, with you, Shelby. And it's like, how did you become interested in Althea Gibson, the great tennis star? Yeah, so it really stemmed from kind of, I was interested in learning more. I've done a Twitter thread about kind of the African-American influence on traditional European sportswear. So like Sergio Tichini, right? We see that was kind of the uniform of hustlers in the 80s, you know, those track suits and Lacoste and our relationship with polo and, you know, the low life gang. And it's like, there has been this whole kind of like black side and kind of black elevation of traditional like European and American kind of waspy prep style. So it kind of started from that, like looking into like, okay, there's this thing that happens where blackness intersects with like these these very European designers, these very like prep waspy, just like that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and and we are able to remix it and kind of make it our own. And that's something that I found in my research research that Althea did. So before Althea wore this uniform of a skirt um, that is showing on the screen, the uniform for tennis was a white tennis dress. 
And she was more androgynous in her style. She remixed it. She didn't really want to go that route. That wasn't her personal style. I'm sure she wanted something that was more comfortable to perform in. And so she kind of remixed the uniform to a polo top, a white polo, and shorts, white shorts often, which was more so the men's uniform or sports, um, something that we didn't really see much of before. She kind of moved away from what we would consider feminine dress and a feminine uniform in tennis to something more modern, more gender neutral, um, you know, and just something of her own. And we've seen that kind of uniform and that kind of dress, it re, it kind of revolutionized waspy, white, um, you know, sportswear dress, you know, on the women's side. This was a uniform that would have lived on the men's side of tennis. And she kind of pioneered that, that didn't exist in tennis. And then it echoed out into sportswear after she kind of pioneered it. So that's what got me interested in Althea, kind of following that thread back um, to like, where did this come? Like Black influence in these very like white European kind of sportswear um, arena. So that's kind of how I got interested in her, researching her dress and kind of what that uniform not only did for tennis, but sportswear, women's sportswear. Now, we do not have any of Althea's garments in the museum's collection. However, this is a collection conversation and it always based on an object in the museum's collection. And no kidding, this is the object. Um, it is an actual period press photo of Althea on day five of Wimbledon. This is the day she won in 1958. And you know, I, we were going to include Althea in the Sporting Fashion Project and you know, I was looking, there's lots of wonderful photos of her online. And I came across this and I thought, oh, I haven't seen this before. I bet it's on someone's Pinterest. But lo and behold, it turned out to be an actual period photo of her for sale. And this is the, the back of the photo. So you can see that it's an actual press photo wow. from an agency called um, uh, Keyhole agency here in Los Angeles of all places. So I was so excited to be able to find this to include and that's what ended up being the back cover of our catalog. Wow, I mean, that's just a beautiful, first of all, object to uncover, what a gem. Yeah. And not only, it was in LA where you guys are based, like what are the odds? Right. Like, honestly, I mean, that's precious. I mean, it's precious, it's black history. You're literally holding it in your hand. It's women's history, it's sports history. I mean, I'm, I'm a nerd, so I'm nerding out over that, that photo. <laughs> it's amazing. And I mean, as someone who focuses on African-American history and Black history, it's so hard to find our history and find it tangibly, you know, not a scan, you know, not right. a screenshot of a screenshot, like to have it and have it be tangible in such great condition and even have the sourcing on the back. Yes. Like, that's amazing. It's, it's a gem. Um, I'm jealous that you're getting to hold it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and I was I was amazed too because you know, like you said, it's Los Angeles. So here she is in on the other side of the world, Wimbledon. You know, this going on, and 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 this image ends up in Los Angeles. You know, through a press agency that shows the global reach that Althea had at a time where not many African Americans had any kind of global reach at all. And she did it through sport, which really is something that brings us all together. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about her being the first woman to, you know, integrate Wimbledon, I mean, that's a huge international stage. I mean, we're talking about a sport tennis that is very white and elitist. You know, you have to have a certain kind of access to money and resource to even right. be able to practice and have an instructor an instructor, you know, it's a, it's a, um, what is the word I'm looking for? It's a solo sport. It's not a team sport. So you're having to really aggregate your resources and get your training on your own. You know, it's a solo sport. It requires access to money. It requires registration fees and all of these things. Um, a story that I love about Althea is she grew up in Harlem and she hated school. <laughs> she hated school, which I can empathize with. I was not an academic. Um, and she would actually skip school, but she, played a sport called t table tennis because they didn't play on courts. Of course, courts were not integrated, um, but she played table tennis and she would beat everybody. I mean, she whooped everybody at it to the, <laughs> point, to the point where a local tennis buff who was actually a former musician, his name is Buddy Walker. He kind of took interest like, wow, you're really great at table tennis. Like maybe you should consider real tennis. And he introduced her 
to a guy named Vaughn. His name is Vaughn Houston. And he was a tennis buff in the New York area. And he actually bought her her first tennis racket. Um, and they later introduced her to Fred Joseph, who worked at the Cosmopolitan Tennis Court in New York. It was one of the only tennis courts that were integrated where she could practice. And he took her under his tutelage and trained her. But you can see that in that journey for her to go to an international stage, she didn't have access to resources like other white tennis players right. would have. She had to have someone buy her a tennis racket and someone else had to connect her to a resource to get her training. You know, um, so for her to go from that all the way to a national stage like Wimbledon, you know, she's an HBCU grad. She graduated from FAMU. And while she was in college, she was, I mean, there was a streak there where in 1944, 1945, she won the American Tennis Association Girls Championship. She lost in 1946, but she made up for it because she had a 10 year winning streak after that. When you think about from 1946 wow. to 1957, she won all of the women's ATA championships. And this is when she was in college. And at the same time, she was integrating tennis on a, an a international level. She integrated Wimbledon right. with her win in 1951. This is while she was in college. And then also just casually polishing off, you know, back-to-back -back ATA championships, just casually. Um, so, <laughs> you know, just something slight, doing schoolwork, winning American tennis championships, and, you know, polishing Wimbledon off her list. Um, you know, black women for you. But, you know, I, I appreciate you bringing up that point that, you know, she was on a very international, international stage and she had to do with probably half or a quarter of the resources that her white, white counterparts had. You know, one of my favorite photos of her, because um, she won the 56 doubles at women, Wimbledon. But it's really the singles that is the, the, the high the high watermark, right? Yeah. And she was the first black player, first black woman at Wimbledon and the first black winner, winner. which is amazing. Yeah. And you know, there's this photo is one of my favorites because this is 1957. She won her first singles Wimbledon. Yep. Here she is with Queen Elizabeth II giving her the trophy yeah. and it's one of only two times the queen herself had ever given the winner the trophy and i think that tells you something huge that queen elizabeth at that time even recognized that this yeah. was historic yeah and you have to think about the climate right like this is still six or seven years before the civil rights movement in the u.s and desegregation right so althea was going to venues that were not desegregated either um you know where she might have been when she and her team or whoever was with her might have been one of the few black people aside from staff uh you know and support you know this was not in the 60s where we were having discussions about desegregation or when legislation had caught up to about abolish Jim Crow which still today we some things are not abolished you know they are not very many anti-lynching laws so you can imagine what it right. was in 1957 to be in a very white venue like that when it's just, it just her maybe, or maybe her and a few other spots in the crowd or her and her team are the only black you know, talent and black people in that venue to have the queen come and present you with an award and recognize you, you know, might've symbolized something to that population of people, you know, to Europe. That exactly. says something when, you know, you know, not to say that we should hold the minarchy in a high esteem, but I'm sure at that time, many, many um, Europeans, white Europeans, held the monarchy in high esteem. And it meant something right. for to see Althea be presented with the trophy from the queen. Because like you mentioned, it's something that she's only ever done twice. Right. You know, and exactly. The, the honest facts were um, African-Americans were mostly would be what? The wait staff um, at, at any kind of club where one could practice seriously tennis yeah. you know and that and, and as you say there that aspect of of integration was even years away um and and it's true we don't need a white person to tell a black person that they've done a good job but no. as you mentioned no. i love that it's all about context and using the historical context at the time this was extraordinary yeah. and helped to push past some of those those strong barriers that should never been there in the first place. Right. 
They should have never been there, but. Another image I love is this one of the ticker tape parade of Althea in New York. I love this. Extraordinary. Welcome, welcome back to Harlem. Welcome back to New York, her, her hometown, you know, with her trophy after her win. I mean, what's better than having your hometown love, right? Um, and she's a, right. Harlem, she's a Harlem girl through and through. Um, so I know it probably meant so much to her to come back home and have her city cheer her on. In Harlem, especially where, like I said, many of Black Harlem talent, like Fred Joseph, like Buddy Walker, like Von Houston, took her under her wing. And at certain points in her young life, you know, when she was 13, they made sure she got her lessons. You know, it was really a community effort um, to get her to where she where she was. So I'm sure it was a, a huge moment for her to go back to her neighborhood and be welcomed and ride through the streets. And again, back to the historical context of this was pre-segregation. I mean, pre-desegregation, right? This was still in a segregated America. We're seeing, you know, crowds of all different kinds of people cheering on a Black woman, you know, a Black athlete at that, something that is not considered right. feminine, soft, you know, the ways in which women are usually well-received and more feminine, um, traditionally defined as feminine role. She was there in, you know, an athletic role being celebrated, much like Serena Williams, someone who looks up to her. But also Althea went on to dominate golf. You know, as if she hadn't already done enough work in tennis, dusting the girls. She was like, you know what I want to do? I want to just, I want to go on, I want to go on a, a tour of golf. And she was the first black woman to also do that, to compete on a golf tour. Um, and then, you know, to the point of that picture and celebrating her, she's the first black woman to be on the cover of Time and the first black woman to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated. A beautiful cover. I mean, look at it. The first I love portrait. this so much. What a portrait. What a portrait. I mean, her bone structure. I mean, it, it. I mean, she looks beautiful. She looks gorgeous. Head full of thick hair. I mean, beautiful, but also she looks like herself. You know, she has that white collar yes. that we're used to seeing her in. And I think it's so powerful for her to be the first Black woman to cover, to be on these covers, because especially Sports Illustrated is something that is largely um, associated with Tyra Banks. You know, there's a lot of conversations around, there she is. There's a lot of conversation around time. Able to see Grace the cover of Sports Illustrated or even women of color have been a benefit to this black woman's work in being on the cover. And people think that it was probably some model and it was really Althea. A woman who integrated right. not only tennis but golf as well. <laughs> right, and I love that this is this. It's 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 so natural for her. I mean, this it's like you are literally face to face with the actual woman. It's you know you are you are gorgeous. You look like a model. <laughs> not everybody does, and you know that's what we're used to seeing on the cover. And of course, today everything is airbrushed and yeah. and so forth. These are incredible because, like, this is Althea. And I think it's interesting also the movement in the fashion industry for so many of the covers to be more natural. And, of course, Serena Williams was one of the, the, the instigators of this new movement to, to show the actual beauty of the real woman, not necessarily these overly done idealizations. Yeah. And it's the sport woman also that once again is pioneering this. In, so great in, covers. Notch. Yeah, she, she upped it a notch. She's taken even what she's done with covers, like you said. She's very powerful in her covers. She looks like herself, you know. She owns yeah. it. She owns her physique, you know. And I love that about her. And I think similar to Althea, she's done that in fashion. And I know that she admires Althea's work in tennis because she actually launched a collection in collaboration with Nike and Virgil Abloh. I think this was 2019, um, called the Queen Collection. 2018, called the Queen There, And I know that, you know, I think, I believe that Serena had Althea in mind when she did that. I really do. It was the location where Althea did a lot of her training, um, where she took a lot of her first lessons, 
um, where she played her first integrated match. I believe it's called, I have it written here. Um, and it was, it was queen themed. They had a bunch of young women tennis players, majority tennis players of color and black young tennis players. Um, and they were hosting, you know, they were hosting an event. I think it's interesting um, about Althea and her, her um, influence, not only on, t on the tennis world or the sport world, you know, through Time Magazine or the Sports Illustrated cover. But, you know, another question is, um, who inspired or influenced Althea's style? Do you know? I don't know where her influences come from. Um, if I had to guess, probably where she grew up, Harlem, um, probably her sportsmanship, like we mentioned, her making that moderation, that um, alteration to the traditional tennis dress to be a skirt or shorts. You know, I think that comes from right. her really wanting to compete and be, she, she takes the sport seriously. Because again, I think traditionally tennis was something for um, leisurely women, you know, leisurely upper class wealthy women as a leisure sport to that, you know, to be able to perform to the best of her abilities and maybe a dress wasn't the best way that she could do that or the way that she felt comfortable. So I would say her sportsmanship and her, her love of sport probably inspired that because in my research, I found that she loved sport even in high school. Um, in, in middle school. So I think mm -hmm. maybe her love of sport really shaped her, her style identity. And even her style identity outside of sport was very androgynous. Um, she yeah. was on a lot of covers. Yeah. Um, many, many, cover many magazines. A cover totally girl. cover girl. A cover girl. A beautiful yeah. one at that. And I love her in the white. I, Absolutely. The tennis white just looks different on her. I just feel like she just elevates it. Maybe it's the skin tone. I um, agree. A red lip. You know, she's giving the girls glamour. She's giving them glamour. And what can I say? I mean, and she's really statuesque, too. So I feel like she really does the clothes. You know, she does the clothes justice. She looks good. Tall. I mean, she could be a model in her, in her alternate life. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, she was like 5'11". <laughs> yes, she's Yeah, so tall. she was really tall. Obviously, for tennis, it's great to have a, a wide arm, oh, you I'm know, right. um, ability. <laughs> Yeah, no, she looks And I believe this outfit, not the jacket, but the, the shirt and the skirt, um, I believe this is in the Smithsonian's collection now, which is so great. I think it's in their collection of the Smithsonian, but I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, it is, it is at the Smithsonian, as it should be. I mean, it's a piece of history, a historic outfit. I mean, the Waspy girls have Althea to thank. They really do. I mean, would we have a skirt? Would we have a clueless kind of plaid skirt moment if it not were if it not was if we didn't have Althea to kind of pay that way? You know, when people think about like waspy preppy style, it's usually thinking about probably well. Right. And here she is on the cover of Sepia, but not in tennis, but as, you know, a professional golfer, just as you were talking about earlier. Yeah, I love to see her in the golf uniform, too. Like I said, she just kept, you know, I'm done beating you girls in tennis. Now I'm going to come and beat you at golf and be the first black woman, to go on, <laughs> you know, to go on a tour in golf as well. It's just crazy, you know, that, I mean, it's, it's honestly... It's the black women tradition to really, you know, go into something and dominate it. But I love that she chose not just one path, but two. Um, so golfers also have Althea to thank for her integration efforts. Um, so I think it's also interesting that not only, you know, did sports, the preppy style, influence early on what um, Althea was wearing. But of course, as she becomes a major celebrity, a major force in 
the sport world, um, but also around the world because she is um, an international phenomenon and becomes a celebrity and really kind of a celebrity as we know celebrities today, um, that she also appeared on um, covers of the fashion magazines, you know, of the day. She did kind of branch over to become a model, uh, really. And this is, this is, you know, like the posed glamour shot, which I think is, is just so charming. And it's so, oh, yeah. so of the 1950s. I mean, she could practically be Doris Day right now, you know, in a musical. And, you know, and here is, you know, Althea just looking just perfect. I've never seen this image of her. I love this. It, it, she looks, the smile is giving radiance. It's giving model. I love it. I've never seen this image of her, but I love it. And like I said, I always love to see her in the tennis white, especially the skirt. Um, I love this. She has her monogram on her. She has her name <laughs> customized on her tennis racket covers. Love it. <laughs> Nothing says luxury like personalization. Isn't that the truth? Exactly. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, the thing that kills me, and I was talking about this earlier in, in the opening, was today sport um, professionals have the ability to monetize their talents, you know, because there are big, you know, if you win Wimbledon today, you win a lot of money. You didn't in Althea's day. Today, Althea, you know, you could buy the Althea Gibson tennis racket cover or the sporting line of, you know, and, and she never had that opportunity in her day, which is really too bad. I think Shelby is, is her, it's frozen for us. Hopefully she'll come back very quickly. I'm dying to hear more of what she has to say about the fantastic Althea Gibson. And I'm so glad <laughs> that I was able to find an image uh, that you had not yet seen before. Uh, it's one of those aspects of research that is never ending. Shelby, um, if you can hear me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to take you off of the live feed and 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 and, and invite you back in. Okay. Okay. So hopefully that oh, will good. that will clear. Oh, I can. Yes. Ooh, good. You're back. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sometimes the Wi-Fi is just, it works for us really great. And other times it gives us all sorts of trouble. And of course, it happens. <laughs> Another one of the photos that we, we saw um, the Queen of England, Elizabeth II, gifting, or not gifting, but bestowing the Women's Wimbledon Trophy on Althea in 1957. And this is a really wonderful color photo of Althea. And I never would have thought that she was wearing a yellow jacket, which is great. You can see the tennis whites of, of the outfit underneath. And here she is with the very famous rose water basin, as, it, as it's known, um, which is the women's trophy for um, Wimbledon. And um, it's uh, something that she won twice as a single competitor and three times as a doubles uh, competitor which is extraordinary. So five Wimbledon wins through the course of her career. 
Um, Shelby, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna take you off, and then let's see if we can get you back on. Um, if you could uh, ask to, to, there we go. Oh, she's she's taken off on her own. So I'm gonna see if I can find her to bring her back. You could just hold with me for a little bit. Thank you everybody for your patience, technical difficulties. I keep getting my that this won't scroll very easily for me. Here we are. See if I can have her come back. Thank you again. I'm still not able to find Shelby to continue on our conversation. I'm really sorry about that because it is so engaging. Let's try once again. Well, I'm not able, it seems, to get um, connected again with Shelby. So what I'm going to do is to finish going through the images that she and I had um, organized so uh, that you can all see these. Uh, oh, here, wait. Here we go. Let's try this. Let's hope. Let's hope. You're back. I'm back. I don't know if it's the Wi-Fi or the technology or what. I apologize. I was trying to get make sure I got back to you so we could finish discussing um, the conversation. But thank you for your patience and thanks everyone for your patience. The technology exactly. and the pandemic and COVID. My goodness. <laughs> Sometimes it's not nice to us, and other yeah. times we sail along. So, <laughs> but we're good. We're glad that you're back. <laughs> I'm glad I'm because we still have a lot to, to go over um, all about Althea. So I was just showing the image, this wonderful color photo of Shelby at the Wimbledon with her rose water uh, trophy. And I just love that she wore this gorgeous yellow, you know, zip up uh, kind of like um, little bomber jacket, I guess. Yes. And we get to see her in some color because a lot of the other right. images were black and white with the exception of her, her covers. And we usually see her in in white, so I love to see her in color. And I think this really aligns with like that preppy kind of European sportswear kind of look, you know, those windbreakers, brightly colored windbreakers and kind of that kind of palette to break up kind of the monotone, monochromatic palette right. of sportswear. I feel like that goes in line with like that traditional look. So I love that she's like doing her own adaptation of that here, but I love to see her in a pop of color because we don't really get to see her in that. It's always the tennis whites. Right. You know, and at this time, there were no sport fashion stylists. You know, she right. wasn't working with brands and branding and right. so forth. She was herself and choosing every single thing that she would wear on her own. Exactly. So she's doing a good job. She's styling herself and she's doing a good job at it. And I love that she usually right. has that red right. lip. I mean, the red lip always looks great on her. <laughs> It makes it pop, you know, and, and anybody who ends up being in a, a public situation with lots of photography, and at her time, it was more black and white photography, yeah. to figure out what worked in an image to project what she wanted herself to be like, I'm sure was an aspect of her innate ability for presentation, not only on the court, but also through having to speak and becoming a celebrity. Exactly. I'm sure it was you're already an athlete. You don't have this team of hair, makeup, stylists. It's just you making these decisions. 
Right. you know, under attack about being more masculine in dress. Um, and is that something that she might have been mindful of more she dressed off the court and for her editorials versus how she dressed on the court? Because I do feel like we get more sense of her femininity in images right. you know, when she's not on the court competing. And, and was that was that purposeful on her part? You know, was she like, I want to I want to show people this side of me that they don't perceive me as, you know, this person at Right. Um, one of our viewers asked, do you, do you, um, is there an Althea Gibson archive somewhere for study? Do you know if her papers reside anywhere specifically? Ebony, like the New York Times, like the Time Magazine one, you know, reading a lot of interviews that, she done, that she's done so I can see firsthand what she said. So that's where I get a lot of my information about her and just kind of like you mentioned, finding objects in collections um, and digging through collections. As a grad student, I have access to databases so I can dig, uh, but I haven't seen one dedicated right. to her. I could be misspeaking. Mm -hmm. I, haven't I haven't seen one though. You haven't seen one either. I, I haven't come no. up, which is a shame. Someone should definitely put something dedicated for her together. Maybe someone can partner with Serena Williams on that. Uh, it's a brilliant idea, absolutely. My thought, I'm, uh, the same thing. I'm online. I have access to certain databases that the general public doesn't necessarily just, you know, being online searching. Yeah. Um, probably the Smithsonian has some collections of her. The Olympics, uh, or excuse me, Wimbledon may have, um, you know, compiled information about her as well. It, it's tricky. At least in today's world, it is easier, somewhat easier to access information that is yeah. spread out because we don't have to necessarily physically go to that environment if those resources have been digitized, which takes time and money also. So, but a great idea to, you know, bring together something maybe down the road dedicated to Althea. Yeah. Um, a, another question that we had uh, is, not only did who who influenced Althea, but Althea had to have influenced other people um, through just being this very positive, outgoing, um, multi-talented individual. And she had herself; she must have influenced style. One of the uh, cover that I like also is Jet, yeah. and here she is out completely of her tennis world or golf world but looking glamorous in a period evening gown. Yeah, I love that image of her. Like you said, we see her in an evening gown. She has on, you know, more pronounced jewelry, very feminine and soft, a totally different neckline, neckline than we usually see her with. We see her with the high neckline, usually with the polo collar. So I love seeing her like this. And I do think she influenced style. Like I mentioned, Serena Williams, I think directly, you know, Serena is a person who also came into push the boundaries of her her ass and her uniform to match that you know there was a lot of pushback on you know when venus and serena first came into the sport and how they wore their hair you know their hair beads and that wasn't something that was that's not a style that is white or european um but they brought that into tennis because it was their style and that pushed the boundaries you know you could hear those beads sh 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 when they would go across right the um, and then on into, you know, Serena's adulthood and being more mature as an athlete. We've seen her wear, like I said, she collaborated with Virgil Abloh and Nike on a collection of sportswear, particularly for tennis. So she would have tutus, you know, she would have one shoulder shirts and dresses on court, you know, so she kind of brought more fashion to you know, Althea influenced in changing her uniform to suit Althea, um, the longer short, you know, um, when we see the lacrosse, the polo, 
um, kind of brands and we see shorts and skirts in the women's wear lines. I think that's directly something that has trickled down from Althea's influence because shorts are something that would have only sat on the men's wear line, you know, for traditional exactly. sports wear in that time in the 40s and 50s. So I think she definitely has influenced fashion. Right. I know Chanel Iman a few years ago modeled in, I think it was Vogue's 2003. Um, you know, that is, that is where it comes from. Uh, another kind of moving forward in the timeline, um, uh, Althea uh, passed away in 2003. Uh, but I am so happy, honestly, that just before she died, two years before she died in 2001, the ultimate recognition, maybe, <laughs> being the cover of a box of Wheaties. And I personally love Wheaties, and I always look for the cover of the boxes of Wheaties. And it's so great that before she passed away, not after, but before, she made it on the cover of Wheaties. Because again, combating stereotypes about how women are expected to be soft and feminine and all of these things. And being on the box of Wheaties, you know, that symbolizes strength. You're athletic, you're a competitor. These Exactly. And who was the second black woman in tennis to be on the cover of Wheaties? I'm not sure. Was it Serena? Serena. Serena. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in 2000, uh, or actually right now, I mean, I was in the grocery store and like there was the cover. So I was like, oh my God, this is so great. Um, and what I love is this is uh, Serena's uh, account and she's talking about yeah. her, how pr you know, proud she is that she is on this cover of Wheaties. And, you know, I mean, she is personifying yeah, Althea. Her, her heroine, hero, Althea Gibson. It's just so fantastic. Yeah. This full circle that comes about. Yeah, that white uniform is fully Althea. She has that, she's embodying that spirit, that skirt and that collar is totally Althea. So I love to see that full circle moment. And again, Althea paving ways for, you know, other tennis players who are black and tennis players of color directly. <laughs> I love that. Let me see what she said. In 2001, yeah. I love this. I love it. I, I, I love thought it, this was just, you know, I mean, this really is fantastic. Yeah. This is, is. It's a full yeah. circle moment. It is. It is. It's so great. And um, also, I, I love this. Um, and now it was 10 years after Althea passed away. And, you know, we, th there are so many people that can be championed for real reasons and Althea in my opinion is one of them because she is still influential today she wasn't just influential in her own time but still resonates with young people today and you know to have your own stamp yeah um is fantastic yeah it's major I mean
Exactly, exactly. And um, this portrait of her is, was actually taken from a photograph of her. I, I don't know what the, the, the game she was playing. I don't know where she was, but it's an actual photo. So it's a, it is an action shot of Althea, you know, totally focused right in to where she's going to be placing that ball that she is just about to whack the heck out of. No, it's a great image. I love it. And, you know, the tributes continue, um, but in more solid ways, too, which is really um, uh, heartening, especially considering the, um, the thoughts that have been going on around um, monuments and who is it that we really put on a pedestal, right, in today's world? What is appropriate? And... Um, there are, are two monuments that have been created for Althea that really are so beautiful and just continue to show yeah, really this woman who was so talented, but at the same time, a very modest individual. Yeah, I mean, she, this deserves, is the, she deserves. Um, I, I feel like there's not enough, there's not enough known about Althea or she Exactly. I agree with you. And this, this monument is in Flushings, which, of course, is completely the appropriate place for it to be, to influence, uh, to be seen, to be admired by everybody in the area where Althea had started uh, what became such a meteoric and extraordinary career. And also, this is a new monument as well. Go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh no, you're fine. I, I was waiting to see the other the other monument. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and this other oh, fantastic yeah. bronze. It's bronze. So the one we just saw was granite, and this one is bronze. And this one is in Newark, New Jersey. Going on into the. It is. It's really great. And, you know, these are the things that hopefully will influence a lot of young people. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, like we talked about in this conversation, there is still not a lot of Black presence in tennis and sports like golf that were very segregated for a long time. So hopefully these right. kinds of monuments will at least spark curiosity of like, what is that? Can I do that? Yes. You know, and hopefully there's more I think through her work as the com the commissioner of athletics in New Jersey for so long. And I agree with that completely. Um, you know, she was uh, an incredibly special person. It seems so sad that she's not with us anymore. 
uh, you know, in today's world, I think she would have even been more famous and she would have been more successful. Um, just in that sense of uh, earning what she should have through her phenomenal talent. Whereas in her time, athletes did not earn or even have the ability to really earn. And as you mentioned earlier in our conversation, it's incredibly expensive to be an athlete, let alone a black athlete in her time. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I can only imagine how challenging it was. Um... I went to a HBCU and our student union was actually the upstairs floor was it had hotel rooms and showers and as students were always like why are there hotel rooms and showers up here we didn't think about oh well when black talent traveled here they could not stay in hotels so they had to stay at the university because we're a black university this is the only place they could stay and you know you don't think of I think she faced many challenges and she took them on gracefully. She shouldn't have to. Right. But, you know, I'm so glad we had this conversation to really amplify her story and share her story and share these beautiful objects that you have, this precious piece of history that you guys have in the collection with people. You know, and I can't imagine what the psychological difficulty it was that she had to overcome herself in order to then be able to focus on a game to play, let alone win on an international stage where, you know, everybody, all eyes are on her. Um, we are so, so thankful, so grateful to Serena Williams for writing the cover, the, uh, the preface to our catalog, Sporting Fashion. And I just want to write something that Serena wrote about Althea. Althea Gibson, this is a quote, Althea Gibson was an extraordinarily important athlete. And she is a personal hero of mine. She challenged segregation in the sport, but the end of segregation did not signify the end of prejudice and racism. And of course, we know it still goes on today. And athletes and everybody have this still to face in our cultures around the world. And it's something that we can never stop fighting. And I just appreciate somebody like Althea Gibson, who did her thing her way yeah. with grace and elegance. Yeah. I mean, Serena's absolutely right. And I'm so glad to hear she wrote the preface because she's the perfect person to write it. Um, but it's so true. It's so nuanced, right? Like someone can integrate a sport or integrate a space and be the first. It doesn't mean it's even changed the climate of that space. That's it's right. Just, Always talks about wearing the veil, right? The veil of double consciousness. You have to always be operating in two different functions of your of your existence, like who you are as a person, and then who you are as a black person. So I can't imagine, like, you know, winning a winning a title or going to p compete in Wimbledon in 1951, and you have to fly back to here to our country where you're not even respected. You know, you're not even seen as right. equal. You're not. You know, you have a queen, you have the queen handing you a trophy and you have to fly back across the pond and you're not even, you can't even go through the front door of an establishment. You know, like I can't imagine the duality in, in, in dealing with that. Well, I want to give Althea the last word in today's conversation. And this was from Althea. I hope that I have accomplished just one thing, that I have been a credit to tennis, and my country. 
and words to live by for all of us because we can all do things that improve the things that we are interested in and passionate about and collectively all of the people that we have to live with in this country and around the world. Yeah. Shelby, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. In spite of all the technical problems, I have had the best conversation with you and thank you so much. And I hope to get to meet you someday in person, not separated uh, coast to coast. <laughs> Exactly. Absolutely. It, it's a date. It's a date. <laughs> and I want to thank all of our viewers today uh, for joining um, Shelby and me in this collection conversation. And uh, we wish all of you the best. Um, if you haven't been vaccinated, go get a vaccine. I've had my first shot, my second shot in two and a half weeks. And uh, also, but continue to wear your mask to yes. be safe and respectful for all of us. And I uh, look forward to seeing you again in two weeks. Take care and have a good day. Bye-bye.